All right. Um, let's let's summarize what we've done up till now in let's see how many sentences I can do it in. All right. Server side pages um, are instructions to create a web page as opposed to being a completed web page. All right. They typically contain HTML, but they contain other stuff. And exactly what that other stuff is depends on the specific platform that you're dealing with, PHP versus ASP.NET versus Java, et cetera. For our purposes, we're doing our development in ASP.NET, which is a framework that consists of a number of components that give us a head start to doing our web pages. They give us a head start in the sense that they take some activities which are very common on web pages and create a component to do a portion of what we need it to do. We can configure those components when we develop the page. We can also write code to manipulate, to use and manipulate those components to achieve what we want. I think that's the semester so far, all right? Um, and this is the big idea that we'll explore over the next while, all right? The next big topic that we'll get into is exploring databases and developing databases and then eventually integrating them within our .NET pages. But really, for the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring that theme. How are we going to be exploring that theme? From two angles. One is we're going to look at more components that are available. All right? So last time, or the first time we looked at a, a calendar control, um, we looked at last time, I believe, at the very end of class, we looked at a text box control and looked at one of the different kinds of validator controls. Today we're going to look at different validator controls and different things and, and just a, a, a smattering of. We definitely want to cover the um, controls related to entering and validating data. And we'll hit a few others as, as we feel like it. All right. And then the other way, besides learning more components and learning more about their attributes and how they can be customized, we're going to talk about coding. All right. And we're going to talk about taking what we get from those components and actually doing something with it. Like doing a calculation, have a text box to add two numbers together or something like that. All right? So let's start out and let's create a brand new app. And today, we're going to focus on, again, at least to start, the controls, the form sort of controls. That is, text boxes, etc. Start off with text boxes and validation control, then we'll add a few more to them. So again, I'm going to go in and I'm going to create this using Visual Studio. After you take a nap in between startup. <laughs> I think that's why I have classes in 105, by the way. That makes me appreciate the blazing speed of this machine in here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go up to File, New, Website. I get to choose where I'm going to put it. I actually could do development right on a web server if I wanted, right on an external web server uh, by simply choosing, you know, then I'm transferring my files via HTTP or FTP. 
but I'm not. I'm doing it on my own file system, so I'll choose file system. I'll click browse, and I'll put it on the desktop, and I'll call this forms, and click that. Yes, we do. I'm going to click that I want an empty website. That's forcing me to do what I just did over again because I changed my mind about what I want to create and decided to reset the default. I'm also going to remember to click in that I want to make this uh, via C Sharp, all right, and an empty website. And browse, put it on the desktop. And then I will click OK, and it creates my page. Now, remember I talk about this as being the application's root folder. Notice that there's a little thingy on it that indicates that this is a .in application. This is the folder also that contains the web config file. As I was mentioned before, please turn on your file extensions. so that you can actually see the full extension of those. All right. That's the folder that I need. I need the file or the folder that contains the web config file and that folder will also contain all the other files that you create. And that's the folder that you will open if you go to open your application again. For example, let's say I was done for the day and I'll just create a new page real quick new file, web form. So I'll create my default page. All right. Were I done for the day? Come back tomorrow. If I open Visual Studio, I need to open the folder that has the web config file. Sometimes students get confused if they have like folders nested within folders and they'll like open the wrong folder. Typically they'll open the folder like maybe above the one that they want. You want to open the folder that contains the web config file. So you would go in a file, open a website, and you would then pick that folder because that's the folder that contains the web config file. And I'm back in business. All right. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, and put some text boxes on this here form. So I'm going to go and I'm going to drag a text box to the form. All right. Notice I can do the drag and drop whether I'm in um, graphic mode, design mode, or source mode. All right. You should give your text box some sort of descriptive name. Don't keep things as text box one, text box two, and so on. Also, like I said before, it's good to have some convention as far as like what you prefix the name of your fields as. A lot of times I will prefix my text boxes with txt and then whatever value they are. And I'll call this the name. I'll put before this a label. And I'll call it LBL name and the text will be enter name because that will be the text of the label. We can go in design view and we can see that. All right, enter name and then the label next to it. All right, seems pretty straightforward so far. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create, though, an unordered list and put my form elements in them. Why? Because really an unordered list is simply a list of, of items, right? And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and put a list of the unordered, uh, an unordered list to have the list of different items. So I'll go in and create my HTML. 
for an unordered list. And I'll create my first item to contain the name, both the label and the text box. All right. I'll put my second item as having a button. And I'll call it BTN Submit. Again, giving it a descriptive name. And the text I will say Submit Data, Submit Form. All right. Now when I run this, all right, again, everything that's plain old HTML simply gets sent to the browser as it is. It's already, it's already uh, been processed. It's already been transformed into HTML. It's already HTML, so the server doesn't really need to do anything with that. Any of the .NET components, though, and you can tell the .NET components because they look like HTML tags, but they're preceded with ASP colon, all right? Any of those get processed by the server and get translated, all right? Now, we're going to take a look and see exactly how it translates this. One second, please, all right? Because the translation here is much more straightforward than the translation for the calendar. If you remember the, tr the translation for the calendar, one calendar tag produced a whole bunch of HTML. Here, it's more of a one-to-one -one sort of thing. Yeah, you had a question? Could you make that wider so I can see the whole one? I can try. All right. So let's go and run this. Now that we ran it, it produces a web page that looks like this. If we view a source of that web page that got generated, you'll notice all the stuff that was HTML just got sent. It did create some hidden form fields. If you remember, those hidden form fields are, are responsible for maintaining state, all right? And then it translated the ASP label to a span tag, and it translated to the text box to a input type equals text, and it translated the button to input type equals submit, all right? So again, this is much more a one-to-one -one translation. All right. What's the point of even using those ASP.NET? The, the point of using the ASP.NET controls with the calendar it should be obvious, right? Instead of creating a whole mess of HTML, you can create one ASP.NET control, and that gets translated into a big old table that has the dates and all that. What's the benefit of doing this? Doesn't seem like we've really gained anything. What's the point of doing it this? Why not just make a regular form? with regular form controls. Yes? Well, because the, it automatically put the stuff in to save the information for you. All right. Close. Does anyone want to add to that? Yes? Like the maintaining state thing, like it remembers it a few All right. Um, it, it maintains state. All right. All these, all these answers are, are like subsets of the complete answer. And the complete answer would be something like, the ASP.NET controls have a whole slew of really great default behaviors and attributes and stuff like that. And we're likely to want to take advantage of at least some of them. So if we use plain old HTML, there's some things we could do to simplify things, but we wouldn't be able to have the potential that we have by using the ASP.NET control. They developed these ASP.NET controls to, that do a lot of wonderful things. 
One, they maintain state. That's a great thing. If you've done any PHP coding and you have something like this, you'll, you'll find that maintaining state is a big deal. All right? Um, in addition, there's other attributes and methods that, that exist on these controls that we can program and we can do things with. So, again, the gain here isn't the fact that one of these generates a whole bunch of HTML. The gain here is it generates some rich components, uh, or rather that they are rich components, uh, that we can take advantage of many of their features for. All right. Now. Before we get into the validation control, you might notice something. If you go in here and you look at this, say, yeah, that's a pretty plain form, right? I don't like the bullet points. You typically don't see the bullet points by the form and so on. In addition, maybe I want to do something like, you know, give the form a color, a background color, and a border. And maybe I want to rearrange some of these things. Ooh. I can't really drag and drop. Well, I can do a little bit. Right there, I, I made the button bigger. But my dragging and dropping to position things isn't what I might think it ought to be. All right? Now, there's different modes that you can run Visual Studio in. But actually, the fact that the drag and drop doesn't work, that we're in the mode where the drag and drop doesn't really work the way that you'd expect it to, is actually a good thing. All right? Because remember, we're not dealing with a Word document here. We're dealing with an HTML document. All right? And therefore, all the positioning ought to be done via CSS. If we were able to, or if we were in a mode that would allow us to drag and drop things, it's going to generate CSS in a very inefficient way. All right? It's best if we take the bull by the horns, as they say, and write our own CSS to control the way this looks. All right? In that way, we can make it look exactly how we want it to do, and in that way, we can write our own CSS code. Now, the question is, is how do we write our CSS code? All right? Do we write our CSS code for the ASP.NET tags, controls? No. We write them for the code that gets generated. That's why it's important to know the code that gets generated when you use an ASP.NET control, because we're going to use that to um, define the way that this is going to look. All right? When you set CSS, up for something, if you're just doing a plain old HTML uh, document. How can you define CSS? The simplest three ways you can do it, you can define CSS for a particular tag. You can say every H1, every link, every H2, every paragraph, every form, every table. We can define every member of a particular HTML tag to look a certain way. That's one way that we can do that. The other way we can do that is we can define things for a specific ID. All right? In other words, the thing that has the ID of TXT name, we might want to treat a certain way. Lastly, we can define things for a class. So as long as you've got that hook and you know either the ID, the class, or the HTML tag, or some combination of those, you can go in and you can style your form however you want it to be. All right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a couple simplistic things. All right? Uh, just to style this, just to show that we can style it and to give you an idea of, of what we mean. And then we'll go in and we will uh, build from there. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to say File, New, File, scroll down and create a style sheet. Place code in separate file. Oh, that's not relevant for this. I panicked when I saw that was unchecked. All right. I'm going to click Add. And now I can define my style for this page. And I'll just make some simple things. Maybe I'll give a background of this page. of 
some shade of gray. And maybe I'll give oops, I did wrong. Maybe I will give the form tag a different background color. Maybe a little lighter. And then maybe for ULs within my form tag, I will give list item type of none. List item type is not a known CSS property name. Really. Pardon me? Is it style? Well, I don't know. Let's Google it. I thought it was list item type. Just as an FYI to make it more visible, I'm using the scroll wheel to resize the page. nice thing about the IDE, right, is it will tell you when it thinks something's wrong. And then you can look at it and, and, and verify, you know, what it ought to be. So let's go and run this now. And we should notice that the page looks a little bit different. Let's do some things like, let's maybe make a width of this of 70%. And let's give a margin of 10 pixels auto, and that should center it. I'm assuming you're all familiar with the CSS code that I'm entering in here. If not, please go ahead and ask or, or review um, the CSS code uh, on your own. All right, I'll click Run. Generates it, and it doesn't work. Why didn't it work? I didn't link it to that page. I did that on purpose to see if you were paying attention. Down. Notice sometimes there's a slight lag between the time you correct something and the time that um, you uh, you uh, you notice the change. All right, everything but the centering is not working. Well, didn't it center the, uh, the forms inside your div tag? I don't know. Let's look. did nothing because I didn't have a colon there. Now let's go and look at it. All right, there's there's what I wanted. All right, because I was set, you're right, it's centered within the div tag. Before it wasn't centered because I didn't have the proper 
and CSS. All right, the point of this is, is be familiar with the HTML that gets generated. By being familiar, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have all this memorized, right? Um, but in doubt, you can go and you can always write mouse within the browser, view the source, and see what your tags got um, rendered as, what your ASP.NET controls got translated to. And that'll help you. You can see the ID, you can see that, and that'll help you in, um, in um, managing your CSS. Okay, so last time I added a required field validator to this. Now again, I'm spending a, a, a fair amount of time in the code view because I don't want you simply to be, um, to, to know only just how to drag and drop stuff and, and not be familiar with the code. Because again, there, there's so many times that seeing the code gives you good insight as to exactly what's going on. A GUI's purpose is to shield you from some of the details, you know. It's nice to drag and drop because that shields you from some of the details, you know. Like what's the tag name and what the different attributes are, all right. But that being said, you need to, at some point, know some of those details. Um, if nothing else, in case things don't work exactly the way that you expect it to. Sometimes, rather than hunting around in, in property windows and all that, it's best just to take a look at the code. All right. So I'm going to add a required field validator to this. And a required field validator Simply make sure that what is entered, that, that there's something that's entered into that box. So I'll go and drag the required field validator over. All right. By default, it gives you those names that aren't terribly descriptive. So I can say, change it to maybe required validator name. The error message is what's going to appear if nothing is entered in that field. And I'm going to type in must enter name. All right. One property that every validator control has is the control to validate. Now, in this case, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? We only have one text box, so yeah, that's the one we're, we're validating. But we still have to put it in there. Because we could potentially have multiple text boxes on this page, and some of them we might want to validate, some of them we might not want to. Maybe the name is required, but the phone number isn't, for example. So you put a required field validator on the um, name, but not on the phone number. So I'll go in here and I'll type in. control to validate equals, and then I give the ID of what I'm validating. In this case, it's txt name. All right. And now we should be good to go. And we can run this. If we try to submit the form, we get the error message. If we give it a value, we don't get the error message. Notice if we give it a value and we submit it, you can see the screen blink. It's going to the server and then coming back. It still has a value that we put in there, which is a good thing. That's the whole bit of remembering the state. It knows what value it has when it comes back. Uh, Therefore, the state is maintained, and you don't have to do anything special to do that. All right. Questions?